Hi everyone, in this lesson we are going to look at the inflammatory response and then we're going to go on to look at fever. So your key terms are unsurprisingly inflammation, but we also need to look at mast cells, histamine, heparin, pus, fever itself, and we're going to look at the lymphatic system. So those are your learning objectives for this lesson. Hopefully you should be familiar with them already. And I'm just going to touch on leukocytes. So you may have come across images like this, and it shows all of the white blood cells or leukocytes. That's the term we want you to use for white blood cells. And um, thankfully, you don't need to know all of these. There are some that you do need to know, and I have highlighted these here for you. So for today's lesson, we are going to specifically focus on macrophages, and these are a group of cells that carry out phagocytosis, so sometimes they are referred to as phagocytic cells. Um, you don't really need to know the pregenerator cell, which is the monocyte, you just need to know macrophages. We will talk about lymphocytes and B and T cells in future lessons. Okay, just a bit of recap here. Um, the circulatory system and the lymphatic system are the two types of uh, circulatory system in the human body. We are probably most comfortable with looking at the circulatory system for blood. We did touch very briefly on the lymphatic system last year. Um, and this schematic here shows the relationship between the two. So. Um, there's something called venous return because the lymphatic system drains its fluid back into the veins. So what do we need to know here? Well, first of all, the lymphatic system is a secondary transport system. And what that does is it filters lymph. So if you remember from last year, tissue fluid, um, excess tissue fluid, I should say, is absorbed into blind ended lymphatic vessels um, found in the capillary beds um, between uh, body cells. And that eventually makes its way back to the veins, hence venous return. So lymph, what it is, is a clear fluid that contains a whole range of white blood cells or leukocytes, there's that term there. And um, what it does is it's involved with the immune response. So you know that you have lymph nodes in your body. You have six key ones at your neck, your armpits, and your groin. And what actually happens here is macrophages um, and other types of white blood cells, which we'll talk about later, are filtered. So lymph, lymph is the point of the circulatory system where pathogens are removed. And that fluid minus the pathogens is brought back into the heart circulatory system or the cardiovascular circulatory system here. Okay, so now we're looking at a cartoon drawing of the inflammatory response. So this is an overview showing everything. So on first glance, it looks like quite a busy drawing but we're going to break this down and hopefully at the end of this first part of the lesson you'll be able to look at this and be able to come up with a maybe five or six mark written response so the characteristics of inflammation are quite um, clearly drawn in this diagram here when um, inflammation occurs we start off with swelling heat, redness, and pain. So pain tends to happen towards the end um, of that response, but we perceive it as happening quite immediately. So um, the inflammatory response um, involves chemicals and cells, and it's localized to the area of injury to the tissue. So what actually happens in that response is the cells and chemicals that detect the inflammation are stimulated and their job is to eliminate that infection source and to heal or replace any cells that have been damaged as a result. So how that's achieved? 
well, let's say you have um, a splinter in your, your skin. So you now have a break in the skin and that has introduced some sort of pathogen into your body. So um, the first response to that is to increase in the blood circulation at that tissue injury site. And that results in feelings of warmth around that area. Uh, the redness and the swelling comes from the vasodilation and the increased blood flow. Certain types of leukocytes, uh, we're looking at macrophages here, these are the phagocytic white blood cells, will start to be introduced into that tissue damage site. And their job is to destroy any bacteria by cell eating or phagocytosis. As a result of this tissue damage, we have pain, and we know that pain is an important protective mechanism because it means that we want to take care of that area, we're drawn to it, and we want to make sure that we repair it as best we can consciously as well as through this subconscious mechanism. Eventually, what you'll see is that cut site on your skin, uh, let's say it's skin, will become repaired. And if there's any tissue loss, so let's say you've cut yourself and an area of that skin has been removed, you will have mitosis, which results in proliferation of new skin cells, and that tissue is replaced. Okay, so there are three key words that we talked about. The first one we're going to be looking at is histamine. Now, some of you may have um, heard of histamine uh, in regard to um, hay fever and, and the like, where you take antihistamine tablets. So histamine itself comes from mast cells. So mast cells are cells within the skin, and when they become um, activated or aggravated, shall we say, through some sort of in, um, infection or cut, they release the chemical histamine. And what that does is it causes local vessel dilation. So that is that the, white, um, the blood vessels become wider, and that allows the following to happen. So more white blood cells can flow to that cut site or infection site because those white, um, that blood vessel has become wider, allowing them to squeeze in. As a result of the dilation, we have increased blood flow, which would result in you seeing redness and feeling warmth also because the blood carries heat energy. The permeability of those capillaries results in phagocytes moving out of the blood vessels and towards the, the site of tissue damage in that intracellular fluid. And um, what you may notice if you have some sort of um, injury to an area of your body is that you will get something called edema. Now, edema is simply swelling, and that is because those capillaries have widened. It's allowing fluid to seep from those capillaries into the, um, that intracellular space. Okay, so we talked about mast cells and histamine. Now we're looking at heparin. Heparin is also secreted from mast cells, and it does a really important job in preventing blood clotting to the area around that cut site. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but we want that area around the cut site. So that area just around where the injury has occurred. That's where you have um, lots and lots of um, blood flow. However, further out towards the safer areas, there is blood clotting. And the reason for that is to prevent the spread of that pathogenic agent to healthy tissues round about. So on this cartoon, you should be able to see what we've just talked about. So let's say we have um, a splinter um, and that breaks through the skin barrier. These little um, red rods here are the pathogens. So that could be some sort of bacteria that was carried at the end of that splinter. This chemical signaling will be histamine and heparin, and that comes from mast cells. So in this diagram here, we can see that the capillary is a normal diameter, 
and the spaces between them are quite tight. We've got red blood cells and white blood cells flowing through as normal. In response to these chemicals, so that's heparin and histamine, the blood vessel widens, so we have dilation, and we also have widening of those gaps between the capillary walls. So therefore, your um, leukocytes, such as the macrophages, can squeeze out, and they will migrate towards those um, bacteria. And what that does is that um, induces phagocytosis. So therefore, all those cells have um, engulfed those pathogenic agents. You have nice blood flow around that infection site, whereas elsewhere on the periphery, you um, have blood clotting happening. Up here, we can see that there has been repair and pro proliferation of that damaged tissue. So at this point, girls, you should probably pause the video and have a look at this link for a summary of the basic inflammatory response. All right, so if you have completed the, um, watching that video, I would like to run through this animation. That will help you complete page 18 of your work booklet, and you can write a nice summary of the inflammatory response. All right, so if you have completed uh, the activities set, here's an overview of what happens in the inflammatory response. So first of all, we've got some sort of mechanical damage or chemical changes that happen in the body. We're going to focus on mechanical damage, so that's something breaking the skin. In response to that, histamine and heparin and some other substances, you might have seen the names of other ones, but we're just focusing on histamine and heparin are released, and these are released from mast cells. So mast cells stimulate the coordination of that inflammatory response. So the first thing that happens is histamine increases blood flow to the damaged area, and hence we have redness and swelling. We have the swelling because the blood capillaries become more permeable, therefore fluid from that blood enters the cut site. And we have the heparin response. And what heparin does is it prevents blood clotting to that affected area. So crucially, we need to remember that just, although we don't have any blood clotting around this infected area, on the periphery, we certainly do have blood clotting, and that is to prevent that pathogen spread. Coming out of the blood vessels, that have um, been allowed to do that because of histamine widening those blood vessels. We have our macrophages, which is a type of phagocytic white blood cell. That will migrate towards these um, pathogens and they will engulf them and destroy them via phagocytosis. As a result of phagocytosis, these um, dead white blood cells will um, form pus. After that, you have this um, repair and proliferation through mitosis of the cut site and then eventual healing. Okay, so here's that picture again that I showed you at the start. So what I would like you to do, guys, is to pause the video and see if you can come up with your own step-by-step -step summary using that diagram to guide you. So. There are four steps in that. Let's see if you can come up with some sort of model answer to describe the inflammatory response. Hi guys, welcome back. We're going to talk about fever. Um, so the fever response um, is something that's quite topical at the moment with the COVID-19, but it is a something that we probably have all experienced at one point in our lives if we've had um, an infection or the cold or the flu. So, um, fever is actually a really important mechanism that your body employs in order to ensure that you are safe and you are destroying any pathogens. So, um, when you have a fever, substances called pyrogens are sent throughout the body and what they do is they 
actually um, reset your body's internal thermometer and they reset it to a higher temperature. They do this in response to that pathogen and um, what actually happens is we start off having a fever caused by the virus or um, bacterial infection. White blood cells in your body stimulate the release of pyrogens. Now those pyrogens will then send a message to the hypothalamus where your central thermoreceptors are located and they will reset your body's internal thermostat from 37 degrees Celsius to a new higher temperature. Therefore, what you experience to be normal will be higher than 37 degrees. So if we look at this graph here, you've got one in your textbook as well, and it explains what's happening. So we're just going to look at this in um, sections. So down here at 37 degrees, this is our normal body temperature. So this, is, this is our homeostatic set point. So you can see that you have little oscillations going up and down here as we um, experience different environmental conditions. At this point, we start responding to that pathogenic infection. And what actually happens is those pyrogens um, will stimulate the hypothalamus to um, increase our temperature set point to this higher level. So what's going on here is when our hypothalamus resets our thermostat to being at 39 degrees, now that might not seem very much, but that's actually quite a significant increase in temperature. So anything below 39 degrees, well, your body will experience as being cold, so it will start to employ its um, thermoregulatory mechanisms to make sure that you are warm. So that's why when you have a fever, you start to shiver, and you may um, have a slightly paler pallor to your skin. You're feeling, um, you, your skin looks whiter, and that's because of vasoconstriction. All that blood's being diverted towards your body core. As we um, experience that higher set point, that fever will lead to um, eventually the fever breaking, and that point there is called the crisis point. All right. So at the, um, the crisis point, this is when the fever breaks and the body internal thermostat starts to reset itself back to normal. Okay, so here's another diagram just summarizing what's actually happening here. So um, I took this from an American website, so they have everything in Fahrenheit, which is um, not very helpful. So I've put in the numbers for you as 37 degrees Celsius is our normal point and 39.4 is where they have the higher set temperature. So you can see that in order to um, achieve that um, sort of thermoregulatory mechanism, we employ vasoconstriction, pillow erection, which we know doesn't do very much, but your body responds in that way, epinephrine or adrenaline secretion. So we're trying to get more um, metabolism happening in our bodies, and we also have shivering. So these should all seem quite familiar if you've ever experienced a fever. When we get to that peak of our fever and it breaks, we hit crisis, and slowly our body temperature starts to come down. But you can see at that crisis point, our internal thermostat starts to reset back to normal, and it takes our body a little bit of time to catch up. So the fever itself is um, responding to pyrogens. So pyrogens are chemicals which are activated um, in response to pathogens and it's macrophages which actually um, respond to the pyrogens. So uh, pyrogens reset the body's internal thermostat and that higher, in, at higher temperature um, has a really important function in um, inhibiting microorganism growth and there has been some research to, sh to suggest that that higher temperature will increase the rate of chemical reaction in your body which will 
and make your body work faster and harder to get rid of that um, pathogen. So there's a few positives and negatives associated with this. So the positive side first, when we look at fever, having that higher temperature um, is a good way to indicate that you're not well. Second of all, like I said, it increases the rate of reaction, which can stimulate more phagocytosis in your body to get rid of that pathogen. And it can also have the added effect of slowing down bacterial growth. This is, um, this is significant because the bacteria or virus that's in your body will have its own tolerance level that it can um, cope with. And if it goes out with that tolerance level, it may inhibit the pathogen reproductive life cycle. On the other side of that, the negatives, any um, extreme temperature for a prolonged period of time could in fact lead to enzyme denaturation and that could inhibit your normal metabolic processes in your body. Having a prolonged temperature of 37, sorry, 39 degrees or more can be dangerous and then verge on um, leading to some sort of fatality that could require medical attention and if that isn't treated then it could be fatal. So there are positives and negatives associated with